thanks a lot to Andrew Bolster for, for inviting me out here. I was uh, working in Fairbanks uh, on this field work uh, this summer, back in June, and he was helping us install this new fiber optic uh, sensing method. And so I think his, uh, his curiosity and several conversations led to me being here to talk to you about a new way to uh, image changes in permafrost and um, study permafrost. Um, I'm, a, I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and um, I also work at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, and this project would not happen um, without a really great team behind me. So I want to underscore um, the collaboration between um, LBNL, so it's Lawrence Berkeley. Uh, my PI is Jonathan Aho Franklin. He's my boss up at the lab. And then uh, it's, a, it's a collaboration between LBNL and CREL, um, Cold Regions uh, Research Environmental Engineering Laboratory up in Fairbanks. Um, and Anna Wagner there is the PI. So their joint proposal to uh, DOD, DOD CERDIP um, has uh, led to this project, which is basically to test and demonstrate uh, fiber optic tools and technology to study changes in permafrost. Um, there's also support uh, LBNL from uh, Shando. She's a postdoc working on seismic methods. Um, Craig Ulrich is a, uh, is a field technician. Um, whose experience is in electrical methods. Um, Eileen Martin is at Stanford. Uh, Barry Feifeld and Michelle Robertson have extensive uh, geophysics experience in the field, uh, specific to fiber recently. And uh, Ian Ekwa was my intern this summer uh, helping me out there. So um, I'm excited to kind of talk to you about this, this method. But I, I just wanted to start with a, kind of an overview of uh, how we can monitor permafrost uh, and this is from a recent review paper, basically showing um, different methods. So for instance, electrical resistivity tomography, ERT, is here in this box. And you can see the resolution, that would be sort of sampling um, versus aerial coverage. Um, and the sort of trend, uh, positive trend as we go towards larger scales, um, the need to basically uh, decrease your resolution. And uh, similarly, you know, the process that you want to study has some depth of investigation and the resolution is limited um, as you go to deeper depths. Um, and so at what you ideally what you want, if you had enough money, you would uh, want sort of the one meter resolution and the you know the the best of best of both worlds up here. Um, and so the, the thought here and what I'm gonna hope to, to um, show you today is describe a little bit about fiber optics and its ability to uh, cover these kind of spatial resolutions. Um, of uh, very short compared to uh, incumbent geophysics, typical traditional geophysics, um, but also very large aerial coverage. And um, similarly, we can achieve uh, good resolution at um, greater depths than uh, common technology. But we sort of do uh, piggyback over several of the methods. Um, and the, the way that this is carried out is, is by sending a laser pulse down a thin glass rod, um, a fiber optic cable it's used for telecom um, all over the world. Um, it's bringing internet to many houses. Um, and the idea is that it goes for you know, several tens of kilometers carrying this laser light. And uh, here we're going to use the actual energy that's scattering in that, gra uh, that hair of glass uh, to infer uh, properties about the Earth. So it turns out that the scattering has a certain optics to it. Um, which we can exploit to tell us about temperature um, along that 40 kilometer line. Um, it tells us about uh, vibration at every, every meter along that 40 kilometer line. And it tells us about tension or compression in a sort of a static sense, um, which tells us about uh, potential subsidence. So you can imagine a, a single strand going along a road for 40 kilometers and having a sense at a, you know, a very dense sampling of that sensor. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to talk to you today about some of the experiments that we've recently been carrying out to, to deploy this and test this fiber optic method. And it's a very new method, so uh, that's sort of the, the aim of my PhD is to, is to demonstrate its um, ability to recover geophysical data. So I'd just like to introduce um, geophysics, fiber optic geophysics, show what the field work entails is Andrew. I'm not sure if he's on the call yet, but uh, Andrew was certainly out there helping us um, with the field work, which involves trenching. Um, and in very many rooted areas, that's, that's a problem. Uh, and then I'm going to just highlight some of the experiments that we've been doing. Uh, and I just wanted, I mean, if you have one takeaway, this is the idea, right? So fiber optic geophysics um, 
is this new technology for geophysics. It enables dense uh, sub-meter uh, sampling of um, large-scale uh, areas. So you can imagine uh, any geometry that you want, uh, whether it be a switchback or you know gridded method or just a single linear um, linear cable to maybe you know infrastructure uh, sort of a image erode erode sub subsurface properties. Um, you know, and the idea here is that uh, large scale could be um, upwards of these areas that we can't yet um, sense with current methods. And we're going to be sensing temperature, um, strain, and seismic properties. And this is sort of the current uh, physics that we're uh, that we're testing. But there are other uh, potential options for fiber optics in the, in other ways. Um, sort of the election. Uh, electrical engineering industry and optics industry are pushing this technology. Um, a lot of civil infrastructure uh, is currently being monitored with fiber optics. And so we're basically bringing that into geophysics with this project. Uh, so geophysics is, um, the, the basic competition is here. Right? We have a 20 kilometer line. And let's say we want to um, you know, set up some sort of network with uh, you know, four sensors or something. Uh, and we, we have seismometers. We have uh, thermistors or some sort of sensor, um, we're in the modular sense, um, you know, not to, <laughs> Bob Wordward, uh, Bob Wordward's work that he just presented was um, absolutely amazing and interesting and tells us about uh, worldwide phenomena that is incredible. Um, but the idea in a um, near surface sense um, is for, for our purposes to look at um, small scale changes in uh, permafrost really complements this kind of methodology, right? where there's some change at a point, and if we can have a sensitivity to um, every point along this fiber in a distributed sense, that uh, gives us uh, much better um, information, not only locally about this zone, but also along this entire area um, of this fiber optic cable. And just some points on the fiber optics, we use an interrogator unit, which is actually sending and receiving the, the laser, and then uh, you know, discretizing it in time. Um, basically, you know, people say that one of the only things that geophysicists do is measure time well. And so what we're actually just doing is measuring the time that this laser um, travels out and back, scatters in this glass and comes back. And um, that, that timing tells us about the distance um, because we know the speed of light. And um, we exploit optical properties of this scattered light to tell us about what's happened at this point. Um, and there's another concept here that I just tacked on called gauge length, which is just the idea that scattering is actually happening along the entire fiber optic. And we can uh, basically sample this in um, a gauge length. So we take a certain gauge uh, section, right, maybe one meter or 10 meters of the fiber, and we, we look at changes you know, every gauge along the length of the fiber. So we, we discretize our spatial uh, you know, fiber in that way. So this is the optic that we're actually exploiting. We have, um, I'm just going to kind of carry this through very quickly, just to say that we have you know, Rayleigh, Brillouin, and Raman are different um, physical phenomena of light. So that if we send in some incident wavelength, some incident color, um, there's changes both in amplitude, um, that is that uh, the scattered energy that comes back from every point along the fiber changes um, in amplitude. Uh, it's called Rayleigh scattering. Um, it also changes in phase, or it changes in color. So if you send out a red light, it might come back a little bit more orange um, from a specific point. And by you know, understanding when that light comes back, we know exactly where it changed. And that phase change might tell us about temperature or strain. And so you can see that this connection between uh, the actual energy of the photon, the, uh, the color of the photon, or the intensity of the uh, photon coming back from a certain point um, can be used with this optics to exploit uh, these different physics, temperature, um, acoustic fields, or strain. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to cover more questions. But that's sort of the end of the uh, physics in, in the sort of hard sense. Now I'm just going to talk about applications, which is kind of a, lot, a lot more fun. Um, so this, is, uh, you know, this, this slide back here translates into these different methods. So we have an acoustic field. Um, so this would be distributed acoustic sensing. We have strain fields where we're looking at uh, distance along the cable. And between this meter, we have um, this change in phase um, increasing. So they basically applied a load over a certain meter. And in a landslide sense, saw this one meter changing. This was pinned basically um, every quarter meter um, along, along a hill slope. Um, so this would be distributed strain sensing. 
Um, down here in the lower left, we have uh, temperature, DTS, is distributed temperature sensing, which we have a fiber optic cable that goes through a, a cold bath and a hot bath before um, being put into some well or into some trench. And you can see they've actually wound the fiber in a loop um, down this coil, and then uh, it returns back to the instrument. Um, and by doing this kind of, and setting it up in this way, um, with these calibration baths and this, this splice down here and the return loop, um, they can achieve 1.1 centimeter vertical resolution in temperature. So you imagine instead you'd have like, uh, you know, several thermistors maybe in a string, and you'd have a limitation on the number um, and also on the, um, you know, on the, on the full length of uh, how long you could, you could um, put them, uh, how, how far apart they might need to be, or how, how long the line could be um, based on instruments. And, and this sort of fiber method, you know, telecommunications fiber is, is about um, $3, uh, $3 per meter, so it's, it's pretty cheap. Um, the instrument, on the other hand, is uh, tens of thousands. So um, this, this is sort of the, uh, the budget analysis. Uh, but just in a little bit more detail, um, how, how one might use distributed acoustic sensing, the seismic technique. Um, we have this interrogator unit, which is essentially doing interferometry, very fast interferometry of the laser light coming back, um, and, the, and the laser light in a reference coil inside of the instrument. Um, and we have Rayleigh back getting from a certain point, and let's say a truck travels past and, and it vibrates the ground, um, and we can actually um, pick up the uh, vibration in the fiber right, right at this point. Maybe it's 10 kilometers away. Um, and so in terms of the IRIS initiative of sort of wave fields, not just wave forms, um, if we can imagine some sort of array that is uh, embedded in the ground in a 2D geometry, we can pick up 3D wave fields. Um, and so the, the large end uh, problem with that. Um, my colleague Tom Daly at LVN has shown that uh, compared to geophone data, um, the DAS data, the uh, distributed acoustic sensing data, shows um, a comparable phase arrival. Um, and frequency content. Um, but here we are stacking, um, which means that the, the sensitivity change, uh, sensitivity difference between the two methods. So fiber optic is much less sensitive. Um, so that's one, one uh, disadvantage, right, sensitivity here. Um, but if we stack in the sense that we um, superpose multiple uh, experiments on top of each other, multiple trucks go by, or multiple hammer swings of an active source, um, we can achieve the same um, data set by, by using this, um, this new technology. Um, so the advantage is that obviously station density, range, um, overall cost, although this instrument is uh, you know, sort of on the economy of scale, is, is really new, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's quite um, pricey currently, but the, um, the economics of that have come down recently and will continue to, to decrease. Um, and there's, there's definitely a directionality to this, which is another point, um, just talking about the, um, the actual sensitivity of this fiber to uh, this seismic wave, there's actually a, a longitudinal alert. It only is sensitive to really wave fields in this orientation, um, which is a limitation currently. You can imagine if there's a broadside arrival, um, it, it really doesn't see that kind of energy, whereas if there's a surface wave traveling along the fiber, it does. Um, and I'm happy to talk about the, both, both the sensitivity and directionality. Um, questions have recently been um, improved upon, actually, but with different technologies, but uh, yeah, I'm happy to cover that kind of question later. Um, this is actually from last summer, uh, a truck going by, so this is uh, 350 meters along the road in Fairbanks, and um, you can see just a couple seconds here of this truck traveling out in this direction, and at each point it's emanating surface waves, both uh, downline and upline, and you can see the red-blue would be the polarity of the surface waves um, traveling along, and we, get, we can basically see that it's traveling out at 65 miles per hour where this energy is traveling at a couple hundred meters per second, which would be used to understand the soil properties of maybe the saturation and the shear wave velocity of the um, near surface. So you can imagine um, how this might be used for permafrost. Um, this, is, this is an animation showing that same kind of, um, same kind of method, but how we might use it with uh, passive source um, energy. So that truck, for instance, you can see the truck energy moving out along this fiber in time. This is recording time here. This is 600 meters along the road uh, going up down. You can see there's times when there aren't a, little, aren't a lot of energy, uh, and then there's times where, they're, where the trucks pick back up and, and they um, start, start uh, traveling down the road again, right, emanating their surface waves. 
And so we can do different processing and interferometry between different station pairs um, to do what's called ambient seismic interferometry. And we look at travel times of that um, energy after it's uh, basically in, in aggregate over maybe an hour. We can look at changes in the frequency content and the phase velocity and sensitivity of different modes traveling in the, in the near surface and then uh, model that for changes in the subsurface um, shear wave velocity. So this might be um, sensitive to things like uh, temperature, phase change, salinity, uh, this, this kind of uh, soil properties, which are really helpful for permafrost um, monitoring. So uh, with that, I'd, I'd, I'm happy to talk more about this. That's really a, a main point in my thesis, but I wanted to cover these other kind of methods, such as distributed temperature sensing, which are also, which are also deploying. Um, you can see that this sort of temperature field over uh, 400 meters of distance, and they have a point every um, every quarter meter here. Uh, and so there's uh, you can sort of track this with this experiment where um, they have these calibrated baths, um, cold bath, hot bath, and the splice, and then it goes down the well, and you can see that along this section, this would actually be your experimental section, um, and they have different calibration methods. But, um, you know, we have these for instance, embedded in wells in, in Fairbanks down to 10 meters, and then the fiber runs back to the instrument, back through both baths. Um, and so this segment right here is discretized at, uh, they, they were able by to get it to almost a one tenth um, of the temperature field and question uh, of tolerance or um, sort of precision on that temperature um, depends on how long you stack and how, how, what you're recording. Uh, how many minutes do you take to actually make one measurement? Um, but they've achieved uh, 0.1 C, which is just if you're looking at uh, daily changes, you don't really you don't really care about you know having 10 minutes or 20 minutes of a record, but you can get that at 0.1 C if you check out the summary. Down, down in your cell that you find out. Um, Calibration kind of uh, requires a water and a cool bath and a hot bath in the field, which is kind of difficult unless you have know, a trailer kind of set up like you do. Still very difficult. But this is uh, a long distance sure kind of game design tool. So this is our, my kind of, um, you know, this is the, the payoff for all that uh, kind of that I just, um, the, what do we, we guarantee the cross? Uh, so the, the, the crux of the current circuit project that I'm working on is to look at linear infrastructure and surface waves generated by cars and trucks and, and different, different, uh, different uh, people that travel along some sort of uh, infrastructure, it might be a railway. And the surface wave travels along um, in the near surface and is sensitive to uh, the shear proper shear wave properties in its upper surface, but um, there's also going to be a temperature and a strain or subsidence signal associated with a permafrost thaw event. So if you're looking at uh, you know hundreds of kilometers of road, um, thousands of kilometers of road, and um, a coupled method where you, you bury a single fiber optic package, you use multiple fiber strands within each package and you record um, on one of those fiber strands, you record the distributed acoustic sensing field and do the seismic ambient noise processing that I showed. Um, you can pick up changes in BS, which is a precursor to thought. So there might be some phase initial um, changes in part of the uh, transition zone right above the permafrost or something like that. And, and there's some increased saturation here, whereas this is still buried in ice. Um, and then there, there is going to be an associated temperature uh, field also, and then eventually the uh, infrastructure goes to failure, and there's some change uh, seeing the strain field, which I didn't talk very much about, but I'm happy to answer questions about. Um, so this kind of coupling uh, all these distributed methods, which is the fiber optic um, sensing, is uh, could, could easily be used for, you know, and we're demonstrating that it's possible uh, to be used for permafrost monitoring. Um, just like Monitoring shear wave velocity is other, um, you know, sort of earth science problems which can be tackled with this same type of methodology, whether it's problems with the water cycle, um, flood wall subsidence, and um, flood, flood wall failure. Uh,
uh, earthquake uh, site response and near surface monitoring of um, potential sedimentary uh, core fill and thickness of the sedimentary package could be used um, you know, to, to monitor this. So these different critical infrastructure um, problems can all, can all kind of be tackled with, uh, with this same methodology, um, just haven't been yet. These are just sort of brainstorming ideas um, for, for later projects, actually. But uh, really a new, new, new method to, to throw at these different problems that we have. Um, so with that, I, I know I'm, I'm kind of running over. Um, but I just wanted to um, show you some of the different elements of the field work. Um, so this is a, um, there's Anna Wagner there. This is up at the Krell site, uh, permafrost um, research site up in Fairbanks, Alaska, just, just north there in Farmers Road. And you can see a, um, a trench here that runs for 200 meters, um, which Andrew uh, trenched some of. <laughs> um, and we, we basically bury uh, telecom fiber in a, uh, in a shallow trench that's just uh, 20 centimeters deep. And we had to go through a thicker root layer in certain sections um, because we had actually just uh, just pulled out a couple of trees. Um, but then uh, this fiber runs back into a container where I use an arc fusion splicer to connect uh, a head that plugs into the instrument um, to the actual end of the of the fiber that was deployed in the field. And the fiber splicer, that bottom of the temperature uh, strand would look something like this, where the red cable comes out and then it gets spliced to the, to the black cable and goes back in. And you can see it just fits in the palm of your hand. Um, and there's certain bend radius constraints, which is why I, I have this loop here like this. But this could feed this fed into a um, a one uh, sorry a, a three quarters of an inch um, ID uh, PVC well that was just driven to 10 meters. And we we did these in uh, seven different wells. You know, we just threw the threw the strand down there, brought it back to the container. Um, question of data. This is what our uh, three instruments look like in uh, in, in the in the hut there. Um, we have strain on one, DAF on another, DTS on the third. Um, the DAF the DAF is actually writing at uh, 10 megabits per second. So we're recovering strain, and we have each one of these meter uh, channels basically recovering a strain field and uh, passively recording. So Bob Woodward knows a little bit about data management probably. Um, I just brought back uh, 50 terabytes in my suitcase. Um, last week, so this is what my suitcase looked like in the uh, in the Seattle airport coming back through. Um, you know, just terabytes and terabytes, 50 terabytes per month, basically. And we're doing this experiment for about two months. Here's a picture of that bath calibration. We have a um, industrial chiller, this uh, refrigerant, basically, uh, you know, safe refrigerant, but still refrigerant nonetheless to uh, basically chill out this uh, bath, and you can see the insulation on the sides there. This is one of these big, uh, like, hefty, tough crates. And the fiber runs this and to the instrument. So this is a cold mat bath here, and I'm not going to up to 35 degrees C. Um, it actually goes up to 42. Um, so this is the kind of bath calibration that's used for distributed temperature sensing. You can imagine if you're trying to make a field measurement out in Greenland, you know, this wouldn't be possible. <laughs> but uh, in this kind of permanent permafrost uh, monitoring sense, we, we can uh, can deploy and, and get very good resolution. Again, this is for the precision of the temperature measurement. So um, just highlight some of the ongoing experiments. This is last year. We, we deployed this um, one mile loop called Farmers Loop Road um, and recorded uh, temperature and uh, the acoustic uh, field, a five day distributed acoustic uh, acquisition. You can see different pictures of us installing it. And then this is actually what it looks like after we're, you know, backfilled the trench and we're just sitting there for a week of recording. It's pretty pretty glamorous then. Uh, and this this year uh, we did this permafrost. Um, this is actively going. Uh, we have 121 borehole heaters for long. You can see me there uh, holding the borehole meter for, for a heater for scale there. And in two locations we have these clusters uh, actually just buried which in week two began to creep up above the
which give us a trenched uh, 2D array of the fiber. And then we have well data also. Um, my last slide of just discussing sort of what else is going on at this site. This, this permafrost site is a huge effort. Nate, um, this is Becky. I don't know if you can hear me, and I don't know if anyone else can hear Nate, but I can't hear him right now. Can Can anybody else hear him? No, lost sound well. Okay, Nate. I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> Let me know. Well, I think okay. he made it way to the end of his presentation, right? I think so too. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask if there's any questions, but I. Oh, his phone was lost. Okay. Um, so I was going to ask if there's any questions, but uh, we've lost Nate, unfortunately. So I'll just thank him um, for a fantastic presentation.